Okay, we are recording. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, this is uh, uh, this meeting is being recorded according to the governor's executive order 7B. Um, guys, thanks for being here. Peter, we have a quorum, it looks like? We do, yes. Okay. Uh, why don't we get right into business? Um, so old business, uh, the self-storage moratorium and regulation amendment. Guys, do you all have a copy of what Peter sent out and had a chance to review it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, do you think, what do you think is the best uh, way to go through? Should we just read through the item to make sure that we're clear? Sure, if you want me to, if you want me to do that, I can just kind of go through uh, page by page and we'll summarize what, yes. uh, what the proposal presently is and then uh, maybe uh, just jump right in and uh, interrupt me so that we can discuss any particular aspect of that. Great. So uh, on the first page, it's just uh, simply a reiteration of our present uh, regulations as it relates to storage facilities that they're permitted in the RC, which is our regional commercial zone. They're also permitted in the business park zone, which is our BP zone. Um, so uh, these paragraphs just simply uh, summarize that at the present time, um, there's a 40 foot building height requirement in both of those zones. So that would uh, remain the same. Um, and that's really uh, the extent of page one is just a status quo of the uh, regulations. I shouldn't say in place now because obviously we're still in the moratorium, mm -hmm. but the regulations that were in place before the moratorium went into uh, effect. Um, and just to reiterate that moratorium expires, I think it's on September 4th. Uh, there is a PMZ meeting, I believe on September 1st. So we're gearing up to try and get this in front of the PNZ for that September 1st uh, meeting date. Page two is uh, as we get into the specific uh, proposed recommendations. And obviously that's the purpose of our, our meeting today is to go through those and just uh, make the appropriate edits to that. So uh, number one on page two is a new uh, definition. I'll just read it. So we're at, we do not presently have a definition for self storage facility. So we're adding one just to be clear uh, what these uh, uses are. Uh, and it reads any real property designed and used for the purpose of renting or leasing individual storage spaces of varying sizes to the general public who are to have access to the space for the purposes of storing and removing personal property on a self service basis. Comma, where the storage units are part of a mixed de use development, either within the building or parcel. So that's the proposed uh, definition. I'd be happy to respond to questions, anyone's comments, that kind of thing. No, I think as you go through this, you're going to hit on each one of those points. So I would just, I would just keep going. Okay. Number two, which is a. Um, which is the use table of the regulations at section 5.2 H3. So basically what we're saying here is we will continue uh, to regulate these uses by a special permit um, and require a whole bunch of new standards for this particular use. So uh, whenever we have uses uh, permitted in town that are potentially uh, can potentially have impacts on neighboring properties, we use the special permit process the special permit requires a public hearing. It requires a notice to the neighbors. Uh, it requires the posting of a sign on the property so the public is aware that there is a pending application. And it requires a posting of a legal notice in the uh, newspaper of choice that we use. And right now we've been using the rare reminder uh, to save a little bit of money. Um, so that would basically remain the same for these uses. Peter, um, on the rare reminder piece, how much do we save? And do we need to make sure that what we're using <coughs> is definitely gonna reach as many people as possible? Um, or are you comfortable with rare reminder and its circulation? Yeah, we're, we're okay with the rare reminder. Um, we do save, I think about 40% of our costs over the Hartford Current. Quite frankly, um, I think very few people catch wind of these things through the legal notice in the newspaper. We've been trying to change that. Uh, we do also post it on the town website. Um, I think the most effective 
uh, notice is the neighbor notice that the developer has to send out to the neighbors within 300 feet of the property. Um, and the sign, people driving by will see the sign. Those, those two things have to be done 10 days before the hearing date. Um, whether that's an adequate amount of time, I, I really you know, probably can't comment on that. But nevertheless, I think those are the more effective. Uh, we have to do the legal notice in the paper per state statutes. Uh, otherwise, it probably is not very effective, particularly for the costs that we have to pay for that. Right. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll move on to number uh, uh, three, recommendation three. So this recommendation, we would, we would have a new section in the zoning regulations specifically for the standards associated with self storage facilities going forward. Right now we have, um, we really don't have standards in place. Uh, so this is all new. Um, so there are quite a few. So I'll go through these uh, individually and we can uh, talk about the pros and cons. So item uh, 3A is the building. Uh, so we're going to require that the building and or the site shall be mixed use. So uh, going forward, any proposed self storage must be part of a mixed use development. Any comments or questions about that? Is the group here including me just to find mixed use again? So um, that's probably something we can think about if we wanted to add a definition, but it's um, basically um, we have a series of different use categories in the zoning regulations. So basically when we say mixed use, it has to be obviously self storage and then it has to be one of those other permitted categories within the zoning regulations. So it's broad. Uh, it's very broad. Is broad good here? I guess it depends on um, whether you think uh, the other uses are, you know, good uses. Um, so it some, could be office space. It could be office space. It could be restaurant. It could be um, residential retail resident. Um, yes, it could actually be uh, multifamily. Yeah. As well. So the, we have a broad list of uh, use categories permitted in both of those zones. So any uh, other use that is already permitted in the zone uh, would help to meet the definition of mixed use. Any comments on that guys or should we continue? Why don't we continue Pete? Okay, uh, B, self storage facilities shall not be permitted on property located on a corner lot. Um, so, so basically the, the self storage facility up on the north end of the Silas Dean Highway is considered a corner lot. So going forward, that would not be permitted. Uh, I think many communities have done that because they don't want uh, self storage facilities to take up prime corners and have, you know, really high visibility. Um, so that's why that's in the regulations. So it would preclude this type of development from happening on a corner lot. Okay. Uh, item C, self storage facilities shall not be located with a quarter mile measured from the property line of the proposed site to another existing or permitted self storage facility. A quarter of a mile is not very much. For example, the entire Silestine Highway is three miles long, just to put that in perspective. So I, I wouldn't object to increasing that quarter mile, but I, I just want to point that out to you. When you put it in that perspective, um, that's that's really not that far, I guess. So, uh, you know, I was thinking of in terms of one time around the high school track, right? I would I would extend that longer. Okay, I agree. Suggested uh, distances? I would say a mile. Yeah. I was going to say minimum. two miles. <laughs> yeah. Well, a minimum of a mile, just because. Or let's go ten. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Carson, I was waiting for you to say 20 miles. <laughs> um, two, mi two miles would ensure that a thousand Silas Dean is not going to be able to, I mean, nothing else can go between a thousand Silas Dean and the existing storage unit. That is true. Because that's probably two miles. Yes. So we can't two miles get also, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. The, might, no, I was going to say, so we yeah. can't get another one in between. We might have some legal um, 
there might be some legal challenges to you know that kind of a restrictive requirement. Um, but a mile, I don't think, I think is probably reasonable. Um, well, what if Ocean State decided to become a storage facility? I'd have to measure and see, but uh, it might be, it might be within the mile. I don't know. I'd have to measure. Know, but then we'd have three of them within a two-mile radius. So this is a proposal. So the Planning and Zoning Commission can adjust it and tweak it. So um, as they ultimately will have to approve this. So I would go with the two because two sounds reasonable, but it makes it hard, right? So that that would be the challenge. Wait, wait until somebody comes back and challenges it. Yeah. What I'll probably have to do is um, do some analysis and see what's within a mile and two mile and see what see what kind of impact it causes because PNZ will ask me. So um, I'll uh, I'll circle the two mile. I'll do an analysis and then um, I'll send this out one more time before it gets finalized so anyone else can weigh in again. Peter, what does that do? I was just going to ask about the Berlin Turnpike facilities exactly. that are up there. They're, are they all like a quarter? They're, they're probably about a quarter mile within a quarter mile of each other, right? Yeah, the two mile would definitely preclude anything further on the Berlin Turnpike um, without without even checking it. Um, it would be basically, you know, what happens on the Silestine Highway would be the question. So uh, do we want to go two miles and see if we get pushback um, or if it's good? Is that the consensus here? I, I would think so. Hmm. Obviously, right. I'll, I'll, I'll also have to look at the two mile as it relates to 1000 Silestein Highway. So um, we'll see where that number comes. That'll be the critical one, I think. Okay. Peter, what will happen uh, up on Berlin Turnpike uh, behind 7-Eleven? Originally, there was a self-storage going in there. What if they decided they wanted to recreate that? Would they fall under the new reg or are they grandfathered under the old because they apply? They have permission um, that expires probably in two years. So if they do not go forward and that permit expires, they would be subject to the new regulation that's in place. But if they built it in the meantime, they would be exempt from the new regulation. Okay, um, item D, storage units shall not be used for activities such as residences, offices, workshops, studios, manufacturing, fabrication, or processing of goods, services, or repair of vehicles, hobby, or rehearsal areas. It's pretty standard language in a lot of these regulations to basically prohibit these places from becoming uh, workshops and people running small engine repair and other types of things out of these facilities. Uh, Peter, just to go a broader, can we add something like, or any established or any business whatsoever? Just or any to, other, yes. Just yep. to throw something super broad in there. Yep, we can do that. Peter, are these uh, regulations uh, ones that you had gotten from those other t cities that we saw the pictures from? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. I, probably have an inventory of a couple dozen regulations from other communities. So these are, you know, based on our previous conversations, I cherry picked and then changed some things to suit our situation. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, e, all storage shall be within a closed building except that within the grounds of a self-storage warehouse, boats, trailers, RVs, and motor vehicles may be placed in outdoor storage areas, which are separate from the view from adjacent streets and property by walls, fences, or landscaping. And then it continues on with another sentence. Outdoor storage areas shall not exceed 10% of the gross site area and shall not count toward meeting parking requirements. I have a question on that one, Peter. It sure. says 10% of the gross site area. What if this is in a, an industrial park? Does that mean it's 10% of the entire uh, area or is it just 10% of the building area, the, the area that the building is on? 
Uh, well, right now it says gross site area. So that's the whole property. Probably maybe it should be refined to say gross parking area <clears throat> to be more specific. Um, or it could stay as it is for the entire site. So that if you went to parking area, that would further restrict it yeah. because the parking area is going to be pretty small in these places. So they don't need a lot of parking. Uh, so the gross site area keeps it broader. Okay. So percent of the parking area. If you reduce it to 10% of the parking area, you're basically saying that you can't do this. It's um, very, very small. Right. It would be, so Judy, um, what they're saying is that if there was a, if there was 10 parking spots there, um, they could only have enough uh, RV space for one parking spot. Um, so it would basically eliminate that aspect. Um, well, we're not encouraging that anyway. <laughs> We're um, not trying to get all these uh, RVs and everything stored there, right? Well, I mean, if if there is proper, um, as it says here, there's either landscaped or fenced, and as you as it goes deeper, things like chain link fence aren't acceptable um, as definition. I think we need to find that balance between making sure that this is going to be mindful to the residents in that area and to people driving on Stilesteen Highway and the in pro business and find that fine line. So how about how about if it was to read uh, the size of the individual property, which would include the building itself and the ten foot uh, perimeter of landscaping and the parking places. So that would increase the the size of the um, the number of vehicles that could be out there. Um, does the gross site area, Peter, would that be inclusive of the um, bumper around the property, the 10 foot bumper around the property or excluding that? It would be the entire site. So it would be everything. It would be the total acreage of the property. Okay. Um, what's the total acreage there? Um, well, it's three and a, three and a half for 1000 Siles Dean Height. Is that what you're asking about? Um, um, you're right. I'm trying to figure but, what that would actually be. Well, but it still it would still have to be a mixed use development, so it would be less. Okay. You know what I mean? So maybe it needs to be clarified for the gross site area for the self storage facility, not the larger right. property. Right. So that would that would narrow it down. Yeah, I agree. That that sounds much better because it yeah. could be uh, you know a twenty building site. Uh, we're not just talking about the Celestine Highway. We're talking about anything that could come up. Right. And as I say, it could be Ocean State. <laughs> Judy, do you know something that we don't know? You no, I don't. Ocean but I'm oh, just okay. thinking that, you know, if the store doesn't do as well as they expect, that this could be a gold mine for them. Okay, understood. I, I think if this site becomes, we'll say that the, um, of the entire mixed use site, which includes a storage facility, if that becomes two acres um, of the, just to use some round map, they end up with a quarter of an acre of, roughly a quarter of an acre of parking spot. Is that, is that right? Um, 0.20. Um, so, you know, is that a lot of space or is that a little space? I think you just, we need to maybe just think about that. Maybe, it, maybe it should be 5% or maybe it should be 15%. I, I don't know, maybe 10% is the right number, but why don't we just take a, a little bit more of a dive in that? Let's figure out what type of space that would be. Sure. And just on that note, um, we have, ver we have pretty restrictive regulations here in town about storing RVs and things like that uh, in residential zones. So we, yeah. we oftentimes, um, folks have to tra ha store these things far distances away outside of town. So, I mean, it's not gonna provide a whole bunch of space in town, but maybe it, it satisfies some local residents' needs uh, in a different way by having, um, uh, by allowing it to a certain extent, as long as it's screened and Protect, protects the neighbors, um, it provides at least an option for people. Okay. Uh, F is self-storage facilities are permitted only within buildings containing three or more stories. So we're requiring these to have uh, be at least three story structures. You could go to four stories basically uh, in both of those zones right now because the, the height limit is 40 feet, um, but we're saying it at least three stories. And most of the facilities 
if I recall correctly, that I showed you uh, are three stories. I think one of them might have been four stories, depending on how you, how you define it. So I think that seems to be a reasonable requirement. Any comment on that, ladies, gentlemen? All right, Pete, let's move on. Uh, this gets into aesthetics. So this is an area that uh, ultimately the, uh, the design review uh, uh, advisory committee would get involved in as well. So we're adding this general general requirement. So we should debate how general or how specific we really want to get here, but uh, it reads aesthetics. The design materials and finishes of the exterior of the self-storage facility and landscaping shall be comparable to and consistent with the design materials and finishes typically associated with office and multifamily buildings in the town of Wethersfield. We really don't have a design standard. We don't get into, okay, it has to be brick or it has to be clabbered or uh, whatever the aesthetic is. Uh, so we made this uh, general proposal that, you know, we, it, it looks like a duck, you know, it, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So we want these to look like something other than self storage facilities and we threw in all right, let's mimic office design uh, and multifamily design. I think the only yeah. question I have there, Pete, is that as somebody, we have a lot of multifamily apartment buildings that are all brick. Um, so if you, I'm just wondering if that, if somebody comes with an all brick look, um, or would we find that aesthetically okay? It, or because it tends to be dated, if you will, on its look. Yep. You, um, what are your thoughts on that, guys? Hey, Mark, we, yes, we, looked at a, we looked at a lot of the pictures that uh, Peter sent us, and it was all different designs. Not that I was uh, in favor of any of them, but a lot of them looked pretty good, and we all agreed that. So to come up with just saying, well, it can't be brick, and it can't be aluminum, or it can't be, I think it comes down to they present it, and we, you know, it, it either has to pass what it looks like or not. I don't I think getting it into specifics, <laughs> material, and uh, I think we have to look at it or planning and zoning looks at it or whoever. I, I don't know how do you, we, we say to a business, you can't have brick or you can't have this. I, I don't know, that's just my thought. Yeah, I, I, friendly, you know. I agree. If we, had an, if we had an underlying, you know, design set of guidelines, um, I would feel more comfortable getting into specifics about materials and things like that, but we have not gone that far. Um, so we really don't have something I can specifically insert here that's already been kind of predetermined. Um, so that's why I went with the general standard. Yeah, but for the most part, design review does look at aesthetics of the buildings around it and make sure it ties in with it. So I think that group alone will make sure that it is pleasing and compatible with the area. Okay. Absolutely. I, I do have one question. Um, it does say that we need to have landscaping and fences and all that up. Um, the landscaping is required in addition to the fencing, correct? Yes, we have a whole separate uh, set of landscaping okay. requirements for all properties. Can we set a height on the landscaping so that somebody's not planting um, flowers in a one foot uh, height? And we're, we're talking about our arborvitae or trees or something a taller to, to actually hide the maybe shabby fencing or the building. We, we have a section on screening requirements uh, separately within the landscaping regulations. Um, it's, and, and we allow people to use a mixture of plants and fencing and you know walls or whatever the specific situation might require. So um, we don't go as far as saying, we, we ha I think we have some stuff that at the, at the time the species is planted, it has to be six feet or something like that because these will grow exponentially. Um, so to probably do anything more than that would start to, it's really in the eye of the you know, design yeah. review and planning and zoning. That's fine, sure I just meant work. that eventually it should be a, a screen of uh, landscaping, not yes. just um, some impatience planted on the no, ground. No, 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 yeah. that wouldn't meet the screening requirement. Okay, good, okay. Any okay. other questions? Let's move on, Pete, thank you. 
So this next one also sort of ties into the aesthetics. Um, so a lot of these regulations require a certain amount of glass to make it look something other than a self-storage facility. Uh, and that goes a long way to giving it the look of an office or a, you know, a multifamily. So this one is uh, a, min a minimum window glazing area of each facade that is visible from a street or from a residentially zoned area shall be 35%. Is that what you pulled out of Peter? Uh, was that existing stuff from Wethersfield or is that some of the stuff you pulled out from other town? Uh, this is from another town. As I say, as I said earlier, we don't have uh, this level of detail in, in any other uh, set of regulations. So uh, I saw several that were 35, 40, some were more, uh, but which I thought was getting might be getting a little bit uh, extreme. Uh, what I probably will do uh, is in, in, uh, in preparation for the planning and zoning is hearing is, is take a look at some existing buildings to get a sense of what percentage uh, of window glazing we have so that we're not being either too restrictive or not restrictive enough. And I'll, I'll report that to the planning and zoning commission. I'll look obviously first at the um, facility up on the north end of the South Seen Highway, see how that compares, and then look at some office buildings and some other things, so. Peter, one of the things it says when it talks about residentially zoned area, I'm thinking about the people uh, behind that property. I'm, I'm referring to just a thousand uh, South Dean at the moment, but yes. the, you've got the, the building, a, um, kind of an amicite area, the tracks, and then you've got three or four houses. I drove back there uh, earlier or later last week, and there's three or four houses that would probably be impacted, actually maybe three. It's kind of the way the houses are situated. Um, when you say residential area, would those windows or the glazing, can those be faux windows on the backside if it's just aesthetics um, to make it more appealing to maybe people on the other side of the tracks? Yeah, it, we don't get into the, the distinction as to whether they're functional or whether they're faux. Um, you know, you've seen uh, some recent development in Glastonbury where they have faux windows. They're not effectively used to look into or look out of. So uh, faux would, would, would apply. It would be, they could be faux windows. Okay. <clears throat> Questions? All right, Pete, let's go on. Uh, so I'm on uh, item I. No storage unit doors may face the street or be visible from off the property. Okay. So the off the property one was the only part of this that I, I had some concern about. Um, so, so you could probably argue in most sites that all of the sides, rear, front of most properties can be visible from off the property to some extent. Uh, so this would, in essence, uh, prohibit uh, storage doors on the side of, of buildings other than those that are used for, you know, entrance into the building itself. So this is, um, this basically then converts this requirement into that it, you can't have exterior storage doors in, in any case. So I think if you look at the one on this, once again, on the north side of the Silestine Highway, they have some doors on the parking lot side, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if that's the case, that would not be permitted because you can see those from Jordan Lane. So this may or may not be too restrictive and not allow flexibility. Well, if the facility, if this as a mixed use um, location I, I, and with, with the storage facility, probably being in the back of the, of the, of that lot on thousand anyway, I don't think you would be able to see it anyway, It'd be pretty far back. So I probably okay. Um, as you have it written, any other comments or thoughts on that guys? Would screening them, you know, with the landscaping apply here. So for example, if they put the doors on the backside facing the tracks and the residential homes, but then they were screened with, fencing or arborites or whatever landscaping they use would that make it not visible or is it just if there's no landscaping done i think if if they if they screened it so that it wasn't uh, visible from off the property they could probably get away with that 
but it would be subject to the Planning and Zoning Commission's interpretation. So if we want to allow that, we probably should tweak this a little bit to maybe say that, um, just so it's clear what our intent is versus how it might be interpreted by somebody in the future. But so maybe, for this uh, building, you may not be able to have doors anywhere um, if, the, if it's visible from other places. Right. Could you just change it to no storage unit doors may be visible from the street? Because really, we don't want them to face the street. We don't want them to be visible from the street. And maybe you could add another provision that says any others have to be screened from to a, you know, to the maximum extent possible or something like that. You break it into two sections. So that, that's a thought. Hey, Peter. Yep. We were, we were talking about the, it's basically going to be a drive-in storage. For, uh, we're allowing like a drive-in storage. For storage. So a large door, you drive in, the door shuts. Um, I think the writing there's a little, if we're going forward with this, the writing is a little bit too restrictive. If we start saying you can't see it from <laughs> anywhere, uh, they, right. a business has to be able to get into it. So if it's done aesthetically correct and it's done so we can use it, I think uh, that I think that's actually a little bit too restrictive. And as if we landscape it right, we could put all sorts of yeah, we could be here all day going through all these uh, letters. But I'm just saying I think it comes down to um, if we're going to allow it, a business has to make money, and we're basically writing this up and spending the time to quite frankly, let a business come in, but we keep putting all these other restrictions on it so they'll never come in, which is fine with me, but we also have to remember it's a business. We're trying to be business friendly. Am I, am I, anybody agree? I, think, I don't want all the garage doors on the outside, but if there's a garage door and it's done right I, and it's open and closed, I don't see a problem with that. Okay, so that, that kind of ties into the next one, which is Jay. Uh, which reads loading docks entrances or bays shall not be located on the street facing side of the building and shall be screened this probably is way too restrictive because this wouldn't even allow you know the main entrance the way it's written uh, to be on the street facing side of the property so that this one probably is definitely um, goes too it goes a little too far I think yeah what type of loading docks would you have in a storage facility, Pete? Um, quite a few of them do have raised commercial, you know, loading docks. So um, the one in, um, I'm trying to think when I get my, my towns mixed up, but the one in Norwalk uh, had the glass windows, kind of a silver design, had a loading dock way around the back. Um, it's, it's actually the only one I saw that had a loading dock, but they did in the back, so that it wasn't a, it wasn't in the front, which is I think what we're trying to accomplish here. So um, we just don't want them in the front, but we also want them to have the if they're going to do interior storage, we, I think we should let them have a, you know, basic entrance door on the front of the property if they need it. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think yeah. things like the like loading docks, though. I think that's, yeah, that's a different thing. Right. That's, yep. I think, should be certainly out of, yep. uh, out of view. Okay. Um, item K, electrical service to storage units shall be for lighting and climate control only. No electrical outlets are permitted inside individual storing, storage units. That kind of gets back to the earlier uh, provision about people not setting up businesses uh, yep. inside of these units and using them for, you know, other kinds of purposes. Um, most of these things don't, you know, and if they do need lighting, they're provided, you know, inside the unit and they don't need to have to be able to plug into things and that kind of stuff. So, yep, those two kind of tie together. I'll probably restructure this and put those close to each other. Uh, item L. Um, so this is a duplicate um, as I'm reading it now. Yep. So that's uh, we'll cross we'll cross that off and match that with the previous one. So 
forget about L for the purposes of this. Um, M, prefabricated buildings are not allowed. I think we're just trying to make sure we get quality uh, product. I think that regulation is probably more tied to the typical one story, you know, garage door style unit where you access it. Um, so we may or may not need that, but I think it reinforces the fact that we're looking for something other than a kind of a stock, you know, off the shelf style of self storage facility. Pete, if I could just really quickly just go back to that 35% between H and L. Yep. Um, what's good about L is that you're saying that each level, each floor yep. of it needs to have 35%, where the other one is saying it's 35%, but maybe it could be anywhere on that on that wall. So I think having 35%, if you're going to strike one, I would certainly keep the one that each floor, each level would have at least 35% of window type of or glazing. Yep. So it probably H would just probably take the word facade out of there and insert floor probably accomplishes that. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Uh, N unfaced concrete block painted masonry precast concrete panels and prefabricated metal sheets are prohibited. I don't know if we need to go that far. Um, because I think a, a couple of them that we saw had a mixture of different materials and it kind of works. Um, Doesn't this just relate to G where we talk about aesthetics and design review though? Right. I would think design review if the proposed building had a just, a, you know, a four foot, a four story wall of just cement block, I'm pretty sure that they would not be excited about that. So right. I think design review would probably yep. nip that in the bud. Yep. So we could probably do away with uh, getting into that level of specificity because there's probably other things that, you know, you don't want. So that list could go on and on and on. And to Tom's point earlier, we don't want to get too locked yep. down on what we're going to take on or not take on building wise. Definitely. All right. So I'm moving on to page three. Um, okay. Yep. Letter O. Letter O. Uh, screening the perimeter of the premises of a self storage warehouse may be required. All parts of the perimeter which are adjacent to residential zone shall be screened by a fence or a wall with a landscaped area of at least 10 feet wide. Additional setback uh, and the reorientation of building may be required to ensure compatibility with surrounding properties. What percentage of the uh, property can the building be? Uh, I believe under the present regulations, it's 50% of the lot area. Let me just... Uh, let me check that while we're talking here, so I don't misrepresent that. Okay, in the um, BP zone, the maximum building coverage is 50%. And in the regional commercial zone, yes, it's also 50%. Actually, all of our commercial zones, the maximum building coverage is 50%. And then you can have a maximum impervious coverage, which is parking and other structures of up to 75%. So there has to be a 25% area that's pervious landscaping. Peter, and Peter, being mindful of the people of the residential on the other, on the backside, I'm talking about a thousand, right? A thousand South Dean. Yes. Um, I think the farther that building structure, potential structure is away from that, um, the residential, the better. Is there setbacks? I mean, because right now the way it's set, they could take that building and go pretty far back to as far back on that lot as possible if they wanted to, I would think. I don't know. Okay. If the, yeah, and, and the rear, so the, that's the, that would be the rear yard. Uh, for those properties as it relates to the railroad tracks and the neighbors and the rear yard setback is only 10 feet. So you are correct. They can go 
they can push this thing pretty far back. Uh, but they also the have to have a 10 foot landscape in addition to that setback, right? Right. So this is an add, this is an add on to that. So, so normally they wouldn't put the building right on the, if they got a 10 foot landscaping requirement, but maybe they could. So, but yeah, it's only 10 feet uh, in the rear and 25 on the side and 25 on the front. I mean, it's difficult to, to put out um, a modification or can you do it just for that particular site that there needs to be site approval or can we put in that it has to be a certain number of feet away from the backyard? Again, going back to Tom's point and, and my point is that we want to find that balance between, you know, being pro-business, but also being um, mindful of the, of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, very site specific question you're asking. And if we use, right. if we use 1000 Silestine Highway as an example, you also have to remember we have the high tension power lines that go back through there. So they're not gonna be able to put a building underneath uh, that area. Uh, okay. The uh, power company would not allow that. Plus you've got the railroad tracks. So you almost have already a pretty significant built in, at least distance wise, may not be buffered with landscaping and things like that. But nevertheless, in, in that particular situation, you have some extra precautions, shall we say, with the residences that other properties might not have. Okay. So taking in line, you're right, those are massive lines there. Taking that into account, how many feet do you think they would just naturally, in order to, to be compliant, be back from that back lot? Would it be 30, 40 feet? I think, um, if I remember correctly, when we were looking at the uh, potential for a trail on the railroad tracks, that varies in width. Normally, the railroad right away is 100 feet, but I think in, in our case, it's less than that. So I, it's either 60 or 80, if I'm not if I'm remembering, and then um, and then you also have the power line, which is maybe even wider than that. Okay. So you add those two together, and then you've got the rear yards of some of those properties as well. So, yeah. Okay. And then uh, last two sections are P and Q. Uh, P reads all fencing and walls shall be made of decorative materials, and chain and chain link and similar materials are prohibited. And then lastly, the commission, so this is one we should discuss. Uh, the, the regulations have provisions like this in other cases, but nevertheless, uh, particularly as it relates to self-storage facilities, most of these self-storage facilities occupy a, a higher percentage of the building than other types of development. And if we're encouraging them to go up, um, we might want to allow something more than the 50% coverage, but nevertheless, so putting language in here, or at least recommending language, the commission may increase the maximum building coverage requirement for self-storage facilities. So that would be up to the commission to determine that. Most of the ones that I looked at probably had a higher percentage than 50%. Some um, of the feet and looking at them, because I went and did some of the Google Maps on it were probably 70%, 75% but right. they still look beautiful. There was buffers around, they were landscaped, uh, nice. Um, I, I think we should, they should have that flexibility. Okay. What are your thoughts, guys? I have one question about the, all of these. I did not hear what percentage of uh, the building must be mixed use. That's a, that's a good, uh, it's a good, good point and a good question. Uh, there is nothing in here right now that says that we've been um, looking at them on a case by case basis. We haven't had a lot of experience with mixed use, but for example, uh, the Borden was permitted under our mixed use regulations, and they asked the they asked the question, and we did not have uh, we do not have a, a regulation on that. So I'm not sure it's good or bad to have a percentage, um, but it's a good. Good question, and it, we get asked that question all the time by developers. Okay, well, what is the minimum percentage? Yeah, I was just going to say, make? can we set a minimum of 25% of the building has to be mixed use? But of course, that could be an office space that serves the storage facility. Yeah, maybe what I'll do is look at, I can look at the Borden 
and see how that, those numbers uh, played out for both of the buildings. That's the only um, experience we have so far. Uh, whether those numbers are the right numbers, I don't. Um, I think in, in this case with self storage, we're looking for maybe more commercial than than that would would have uh, that has accomplished. So it would probably be a higher standard even if I do the analysis. Um, so, but you're right. I think we probably should have something in here, or maybe can at you, least some at least some guidance. Can you, can you put in a higher amount and say? Uh, that any anything less would have to have an exemption from the commission. Could do that. I just, just to give people the idea that we're not looking for storage facilities, we're looking for mixed use. You might you might actually even have to have two standards. You might have to have a standard if they're doing it within <laughs> the self storage building. We have seen that. That would probably be a lower number. And then a higher number for if you're doing multiple buildings. I'd have to think about it some more, but. But we're be... talking now in this building, particularly using the space that's already there. So do we want a third of that to be now become mixed use or do we want basically a storage facility with an office? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why I'm saying there's probably different state, but I, I think our preference in that case would be for the building to be demolished and there to be multiple multiple buildings or mixed use within one of the buildings and then other pad sites at least that's kind of the re reusing that building i think is um it's got it's a lot of challenges and may not be what the town wants either right um, I do think, you know, Pete, we need to be more mindful uh, on that. I think Jay brings up a good point. Um, you know, if it was something, you know, at whatever the number is, we should say, you know, a minimum of 30% or 25% of this physical structure needs to be um, mixed use. Whatever that, and I'm not saying those are the right percentages, right. but there should be something probably finite. And, and frankly, um, you know, we can have these things and they can go before the commission and say, hey, we want to, we, we'll say we say it's 35% and say, well, we, we, we can do 30. And this is how it looks like. They could make an exception. Uh, so I, I think having a, high, a percentage that might be more on the higher side than the lower side would probably be in our best interest, but could be modified if somebody presents a plan that looks good. Okay, so, so just put, get a number in there, but have the ability uh, for the commission to uh, look at it on a case by case basis. Yes. Okay. What do you guys think about that? Okay. I see a lot of heads nodding. So. Yep. And then the last uh, last proposal is to establish a parking requirement. We really do not have a parking requirement for these uses. These do not um, require uh, a great deal of parking, particularly if we're encouraging people to drive inside, um, you know, to, to access their units. Uh, so we're, we're putting a uh, proposed uh, parking requirement for self-storage facilities of one parking space for every 5,000 square feet of uh, floor area. And, and I'm thinking that might even still be high. I may have to do some more research on, on these facilities and see what they, um, for example, the Jordan Lane one, the parking lot's always empty when I drive, drive by there. If there are two or three people, you know, going into the building at, at the same time, it's a lot. So. Um, but that's because that's because it's not mixed use. So if you have mixed use, you may need more parking space. If you have mixed use, there would be, there are other parking requirements that kick in oh, for that okay. other use. Okay. Okay. So this is just for the self storage. So that's, uh, that's what I had proposed. Um, I have to finalize this by, I think, Friday in order to get it uh, on the September 1st uh, P&Z hearing date. So that's my uh, uh, goal is to get this uh, out the door by uh, Friday. Peter, is it possible to float, and I don't know if this is, um, um, is feasible or not, but is it possible to float this by members of, of P&Z? 
to see if they have anything that sticks out to them. Because if we go to that date in September and there's a significant issue comes up, we could get be past the moratorium uh, point where we need to make a, a modification. I'm just curious if there's a way that we can maybe get a, a, somebody to take a look at it. Um, probably not. I, I do have a PNZ meeting um, tonight, actually. Um, I once we file the application, I cannot have them commenting on it uh, from a legal uh, perspective. But right. between now and the end of the week, uh, I could float it to them um, and give them a chance to look at it beforehand. I was hoping Dan was going to Dan Silver was going to be here today. He would be a good uh, barometer. Uh, I can maybe reach out to him. Uh, I did send him uh, these regulations, so maybe I'll uh, reach out to him separately as well and see if I can get some feedback. But I can discuss it uh, tonight at tonight's PNZ meeting uh, if I have the group assembled. Uh, so maybe I'll try and take a few minutes of their time and get some get some feedback. Um, so I can certainly uh, try and effort that today. Yeah, I, and, and I think if I, I think it won't hurt. I think if anything, it could help. Um, I certainly don't think it hurt. Tony, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think if you get, Dan Silver is a good feeler, I think, for uh, P and Z, knowing what they want. So, I mean, if we get his opinion alone, even, that'll give us a good benchmark to go with. I mean, the only other real critic on there or stuff is George Oikel. So he might be another one to run it by. Uh, the others, more or less, you know, are pretty quiet on there. Okay. We do have an, uh, we have uh, our chairman left, uh, PNZ, and we've got two new members who were appointed last week. So we have some new leadership and we'll have some new faces there. So th those may be the wilder, wild cards who haven't been, they weren't involved in this whole moratorium and, you know, all the build up to this. Okay, so it hey, sounds like hey, Peter. Yes, oh, Peter and Mark, I apologize. I need to drop. It's Paul. Do, do you need anything from me? Um, thanks for your participating. You get a sticker for participation. <laughs> It'll be in the mail. Thanks. I, I could put it on my mask. Thanks. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Um, Pete, um, the agenda that you have here, um, were we going to, is this going to be a, a full EDIC meeting? Uh, it, anytime, uh, you know, a quorum of you guys gets together, it's a, it's a regular meeting. If you have anything else on the, I wanted to put all that stuff on there in case somebody had something they wanted to bring up, but we don't have to go through all the uh, individual items. Okay. Uh, anybody on the group um, with regards to the agenda have anything they'd like to share or or add comment to? Mark. Patrick? Yeah, I don't really have like an official council report. This is more just two items that I wanted to bring here. Um, uh, actually, the first one, now that I'm thinking about it, I think it might be a little bit too preliminary, but um, it may be something to take offline with, uh, with you, Pete. But... Um, I did speak with a developer with kind of an interesting idea for the uh, Masonic building in Old Weathersfield. He kind of wants to keep the, uh, the aesthetics and, and uh, kind of do a, a interesting twist off the Mason idea. And uh, he was kind of inquiring about the EDIC and the facade improvement program, but that's a little, uh, little premature. But the second thing is um, I actually heard through the grapevine. So um, I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention, uh, especially the UP uh, rings end. Um, they're, I heard that they're potentially moving into the Rite Aid next door uh, to potentially do a lumber yard. Oh. Um, I don't know if anyone's approached you yet, but if not, maybe we could potentially reach out and uh, speak, speak to some folks over there to see um, what we could do about kind of helping that process along. Yeah, I, they have not reached out yet. I'll, I'll reach out to the um, property owner okay. and confirm, you know, that that has some legs. He, he normally... Uh, it's pretty good about reaching out to me. So let me do that at least, rather okay. than reach out to the Rings End people uh, and see what we can find out. I, I owe him a call anyway, just to see how he's doing with the shopping center and you know some other places. So right. thanks, for, thanks for the info. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, anything else, ladies and gentlemen? <clears throat> All right, um, I'm a motion to adjourn. So move. 
Second, Judy. All right, Judy's Judy muted, but I think she said yes. Um, guys, thank you for your time. I think we uh, this is uh, Pete. Thank you for your work on this. Uh, this is a nice collage of a lot of that data that you put together, and I think it's pretty thoughtful. Um, how do you want to present it uh, to? Do we need to? Can we? Uh, vote via email or do we need to get another zoom and a quick vote uh, zoom if we once you've got the changes how would that work to get this done before now and the end of the week so i will um work on the changes um that, that i can and uh i'll go um more conservative because the planning and zoning commission can change this and adjust it and if um you know i find out some other information i'll obviously put it in my final report to them before they would vote on it. So um, I think as long as we get uh, the main items in here, those can be adjusted. We can't add anything substantially new, um, but I did get some new information from you folks today, which I will incorporate. Um, so there is some flexibility in, in tweaking this during the hearing process and before it gets approved. So um, I, I think we should be good with that, but I will uh, email it out. If you do get an email from me, just be mindful that I, I really probably by the end of uh, Thursday, I have to finalize this. So if you get something what, uh, Thursday and you can carve out a few minutes and look at it and get back to me, if you had any comments, I would fully appreciate that so that we can stay on uh, task here. Okay. So will that serve as a vote, Pete, at one point that we adopt the language? Well, I think if you want to um, go on record as voting, uh, in support of filing the proposed regulation amendments, we should probably do that right now with a caveat that I will make, you know, the appropriate comments as noted, you know, in this discussion today, so that there's an official uh, vote of support, uh, so that when it goes to planning and zoning, there can be actually a letter from uh, the EDIC and the RDA uh, in support right. of the changes. So. Um, yeah, probably now would be the time to do that because unless we have another meeting before uh, the end of the day on Thursday, this would be our last uh, shot together. Okay, so let me make a motion on that, if that's okay with the group. Um, I make a motion that we accept uh, with the stated changes, um, modification of the regulations for storage facilities uh, uh, here in town. Second. Aye. All those Aye. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Passes. Great. All right, good. So, um, Peter, you're going to send out the, the, there's only a hint, the two or three changes. You'll send those out. And if anybody has any issues, get back to Pete right away um, once you read through them. So, thank you for your time, everyone. Have a great day. You too. All right, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Peace. Thanks, Peter. Yep. Thanks, guys. Mark.